All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I am delighted to be joined by Amy Wong, who is just up, up in Northern California in Berkeley. How are you doing, Amy? Oh, I'm fabulous today, John. How are you? I'm doing great. <laughs> And Amy is the founder of Always On Purpose, a speaker, executive leadership coach, facilitator. And you have just released your book, Living On Purpose, Five Deliberate Choices to Realize Fulfillment. And you should show, show everybody your book there. Ooh, I will. I'm yeah. so excited. It's been a long time coming. <laughs> Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. And yeah. what we're going to talk about today is like how to live and lead on purpose. Um, so, Amy, let's get straight into it. I, I feel today that many people and maybe we're all guilty but many people are just life is happening to them mm -hmm. as opposed to them actually you know taking control or having a purpose um and more and more with you know all these crises and everything that happens is that people are feeling more and more uh, disempowered so again they're kind of letting things happen to themselves yeah. what do you think oh i completely agree i completely agree it's feel like we're all in autopilot mode, living by default. And we've got this passive engagement going on with life. I mean, and I, I think largely due to just these inputs that are coming towards us at this crazy rate and the intensity that we're all experiencing, you know, it's easier to just go on mute and to deaden and to numb ourselves. And so I absolutely agree that, you know, we're, we're, you know, and, a, a, and we're all on autopilot, I would say for sure. So how, do, how does how does one start to lift yourself out of it and start to, as you said, like live, you know, live with purpose? Um, I mean, how do you start to actually take control of things? Because I think I think most people struggle with the starting point. I think a lot yeah. of people say, yes, this is what I want to do, but they just yeah. don't know how to put one foot in front of the other. Yeah, absolutely. You know, when I wrote this book, you know, it was really important to me to make the distinction between, you know, that when we talk about something happening on accident or by default versus something on purpose or, or in this case, living on purpose. And so purpose, as I use it in this book, is really more of an adverb than a noun. And it's mm. to be on purpose, which to me really means to be fully awake in our moments and when we're fully awake, we have the ability to harness our superpower of choice. Because when we're in default mode or autopilot mode, where life is happening to us, we're not really exercising choice. We're just letting things happen, but we're not choosing them. And so one of the biggest parts about living on purpose is really deciding to wake up. Because a lot mm -hmm. of us have fallen asleep at the wheel because we think it's just easier. And, and sometimes it can be easier because there's just too much coming at us, but, but that comes at a cost. So to, to really truly live on purpose, it means, okay, I want to wake up. I want to be fully alive, eyes wide open in each of my moments where I'm going to harness that space that lives between the stuff of life and then how I respond or react to it. And so you know, I'll, I'll just leave it with this. There's that amazing quote that I must say probably three times in a week or so, because I just love it so much. And it's by Victor, Victor Frankl, mm -hmm. who was a, um, you, you're you probably familiar, a Holocaust yep. yeah, survivor. Yeah. He wrote in Man's Search for Meaning. And the, the quote is, between stimulus and response, there is space. And in that space lies our ability to choose our response. And in our choice, lies our freedom and our growth. And, you know, all of us truly want to feel free. We want to feel at peace. We want to feel like we're growing. We want to feel meaning. And so to do that, we have to harness that superpower of choice, which lives in that space. Yeah, that's great. I'm, and, and and obviously, Viktor Frankl, I mean, if he could do that in the in the in a concentration camp in the worst of, of, of situations, it definitely is a, is a great message for the rest of us. Uh, here's here's one of the things, though, Amy. I think is 
is working against us is that all of these social media devices, new mm. instant, we, we've, I feel like that we allow ourselves to be bombarded with all of this stuff so that we never have to spend any time in our own heads. Ugh. you know with ourselves yeah. so and i th and i think that's and I, and I think that's getting that's getting worse and worse as almost pandemic levels of people just avoiding ever being alone with their own thoughts oh i mean you said that so perfectly i completely agree and you know i mean when you look around us there's i mean the depression rates are higher <laughs> happiness levels are lower it's we've got <sighs> We've, we've learned to passively engage in life because we've become conditioned to being entertained by, you mm. know, social media and all of these inputs. And so, you know, when we're entertained, we don't really have to engage. And I think we learn a certain, it's like we shift in, into a certain gear. It's like, okay, passive mode. But mm -hmm. passive is no way to live. <laughs> you know, there's a very yeah. big difference between passive and active. And, you know, to take full control of one's life, to be in the driver's seat of one's life. You know, you want to actively engage, but with all of the stimulus, it's really easy to just settle into that passive mode. And I think absolutely social media is a huge contributor to that. You know, and I have two children, a 14 year old and a nine year old. And, you know, I'm constantly minding just how much of their inputs are causing them to want to shift into that passive mode. And, mm. you know, and that, and that scares me because, you know, they're in their learning years where they, I want them to be actively engaged and curious. And so this is, this is something I think about a lot. Yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, it's, it's a little scary when we, especially when you think of the dopamine addictions that, uh, you know, kids are having now where this zombie scrolling is giving them dopamine hits and they crave it throughout the day. So it's, it's quite, it's, it's quite scary. But I think yeah. the other thing that is quite scary too is, as you said, is, is when somebody does say, okay, I'm going to wake up, I'm going to, I'm going to try and make deliberate choices, you know, yeah. take control of my life. There's a real fear there of, of how other people will will react, you know, of rejection, mm. of of failure, all of those things. I, you know, when you start to say, "Yeah, I'm going to do this," and then you go, mm, "But what if?" <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. What if? I mean, that's that is, gosh, that is such a topic of conversation in my world, particularly in my coaching conversations. You know, the mm -hmm. fear of failure is so big, and I love that you mentioned rejection because, you know, something that's fascinated me that I discovered when I was in certification to become or certified in conversational intelligence, you know, you learn, you're, I'm learning the neuroscience of trust. And I became very educated in this thing called rejection and, and what rejection really is for us humans. And this massive light bulb went off. And that actually is why I knew I had to write this book because that was the missing piece. The neuroscience of rejection was the missing piece that really made everything in this book click. But, you know, rejection is something all of us are avoiding on a primal subconscious level. And it's, we know this scientifically, but we're not talking about this. And yet if we knew about what the implications were and what really is going on in our brain and our body when it comes to, to social threats, I think we would be a completely different <laughs> bunch <laughs> operating very differently with a lot more compassion. But, you know, this whole thing around our fear of rejection, it determines so much on a subconscious level, the beliefs we form, how we perceive, how we navigate. And, you know, and none of us really know that. And so that's why, you know, I had to put this in the book because it was a game changer for me personally. So I thought, oh, Got to let others know. I mean, there's a lot going on here. Yeah, and and it's it it is, and it's fascinating how, um, I guess in many ways we don't want to admit to ourselves that we're afraid of of rejection. Because let's face it, I mean, we're we're all we're all told to be strong, independent people. So therefore, you know, and focus forward, and don't worry about all that sort of stuff. But the reality is, whether it's in work or in our social circumstances, our brain is going crazy all the time, like wondering, well. Why did they say that? Why, why? What was that look? All of that stuff. Oh, I mean, a hundred percent true. And you know, I'll share that rejection is an experience, literally processes as physical pain. So it registers in what's mm. called the pain matrix, which is unlike any other 
emotion or emotional experience. um, So think about that. Rejection literally feels like physical pain to the brain. And so then you have to ask, well, why is that? What's going on? And so, you know, when you take a step back and you look at the human condition, you know, we know we've been told we're all hardwired for connection and we're social beings and, you know, we, we need a tribe. But then you have to wonder like, well, why? Why is that? Well, here's what what I've come to discover is that, you know, when we're born as a human, we're born survival brain dominant. And mm-hmm. most of that critical brain development doesn't happen out until out, we're outside of our mother's womb. So we're necessarily dependent on our caregiver for the first couple of years of life. So when a child, when a baby is born, that baby's brain knows that death to that body is really going to be rejection because I, mom needs mom or dad needs to buy in for me to survive. Food, water, shelter will follow if mom or dad buys in. And so rejection is literally as triggering as a tiger jumping out of a bush. And so that wiring, that that need to avoid rejection, like we avoid people with sharp knives, that mm-hmm. wiring exists from the moment we are born to the day that we die. And yet we don't talk about it. <laughs> we just, mm-hmm. we're like toughen up, you know, but the, our neurochemistry and our neurobiology is really... It, we can't get away from the trigger that happens when we experience those social threats. Yeah. So how do how do how do we start to deal with that? Because I mean, I think that's a fascinating point. Because I do think if anybody is is honest with themselves and they think about the last time they felt like this, uh-huh. um, if they were honest about how how large a feeling, as you said, or even physical, how that was, then they would realize this is something. Yeah, I, I can't continue to live like this. So how do, how do people start to overcome this? Because it, it seems like it's so, as you said, I mean, it's such an obstacle to to just enjoying life, to be honest. You know, yeah. I mean, I think it really depends on how you look at it. And so from my, from, from my standpoint, I see that, okay, this is just a neurobiological reality that all of mm. us are dealing with. And so what that does for me is just, is absolutely heighten the sensitivity of compassion I have for every single human on the planet. Because conscious or not, each person is craving that sense of safety and belonging with one another because that is the equivalent of thriving. Social Mm -hmm. rejection, you know, is the same as surviving. And so on the, on, you know, on the one hand, I would say though this awareness itself can do wonders to help you create more trusted relationships with others because it's absolutely going to increase your empathy and your compassion. And then the second, with this awareness, then you can have grace with yourself, right? Because if you get turned down by the job offer or you don't get the promotion or you get turned down by the person you really like, you know, and you're really hurting, you can just tell yourself, you know what? This is just my body and brain's way of moving through this experience. And so meeting the meeting those moments without the resistance of thinking it should be different or wanting it to be different does a lot to get us through those moments smoother and 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 more, you know, just more healthy. But mm-hmm. uh, you know, I, I will say cuz I always share this in my CIQ classes and workshops that I <laughs> that I give for teams. You know, if you are experiencing rejection and you're having a hard time with it, you can take a Tylenol because it targets the same place and it actually helps. <laughs> so oh, I, always, right, right. I always share that. <laughs> wow, that's fascinating. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and I think the uh, the other part is, uh, as you were saying, is is it depends how much power you give to to it or how much you in, invest in it. You know, my son does some, um, he does some acting um, up in L.A. And and there's a great there's a great education in rejection, right? Because, um, yeah. But the reality at the end of the day is there are so many variables at play that you can't take it personally at the end of That's the day, right. because it could be that you don't fit with the other actors, you know, just you don't look like a family or as, as his acting teacher said early on, you know, at the last minute, they may decide to replace your role with the dog. So mm. uh, and, and you'll never know. So um, so yeah. I think the ability to to not take everything you know so personally and and hang on to it i think uh, i think that's a skill set that uh, a lot of people need to develop oh john i mean that you couldn't have said that more perfectly so much wisdom in what you just said and there's so much more to what you just said this this ability to not take things personally that that really is our ticket to freedom 
But then you have to wonder, well, what does it take to not take things personally? And so something I really dive into in the book and something I'm, a, I'm, I'm really passionate about is you know, everything that we experience out there and whether we take things personally or not really depends on the relationship we have with ourselves, which really is what is it that I believe about myself? What is it that I choose to believe about myself? What is it that I choose to know about myself? Because those, those fundamental choices at the belief and the knowing level about self, that I'm good enough, that I'm not good enough, that I'm smart enough, that I'm not smart enough, that I'm whole or I'm complete, those fundamental choices form the perceptual, fundamental perceptual lens that we perceive through that gives rise to the meaning and the color around us. So our experience that we are having, the reality that we experience is due to that lens that is due to that relationship. And so my ability to truly not take something personally or not really stems from how I regard myself. And so there's so much to this conversation, but mm -hmm. I love that you went here because this, this and literally and figuratively in my book, I mean, this is the ticket to freedom is really understand how, how important this relationship with self is because it determines everything. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and as I, as I mentioned earlier, unfortunately, I don't think enough people are spending time with, with themselves. And the other thing you mentioned earlier is triggers. And I always think triggers are fascinating because, you know, we all have them. And sometimes, uh, as you would know better than I, sometimes they can be something from childhood, something innocuous or something, but it continues to trigger you. And unless you start to recognize these triggers and sort of understand where they're coming from, they're always going to derail you. Oh, absolutely. You know, the thing about a trigger is that when you get triggered, your 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 body and your brain, all aspects of your nervous system, I'm trying to keep you safe. And the mm -hmm. brain can't differentiate between environmental threats and social threats. And so it's picking up on all the signals around us to try to keep us safe. And, you know, for whatever reason, if the brain and the body say, oh, whoa, whoa, there's a threat over here, boom, we get triggered. Now, that trigger is going to release cortisol. And that's the stress hormone. That's the fight or flight hormone. And the thing about cortisol, and this is so fascinating to me, when we get triggered, cortisol is, that is released. And the job of cortisol is to shut down our prefrontal cortex. It's, it's to mute our prefrontal cortex. The most rational, objective, logical, empathetic, compassionate, forward-looking part of our brain goes offline. And so when we get triggered, we literally don't have the ability to be objective in that moment, to be rational in that moment. And so, you know, it, to really get ahead of the trigger, which really will take us down, because I'm sure we've all had that experience, right? You get triggered mm -hmm. and then you do something and then you're like, gosh, mm -hmm. I really wish I didn't do that. Yeah. Well, that's what happens. But, you know, there's an amazing technique that that you might be familiar with that, it, you know, that I, I love the phrase for this. It's called name it to tame it. And so mm -hmm. when you get triggered just by naming the trigger from that observant, non-judgmental place, like, oh, I've just been triggered. That does a lot to get out ahead of the cortisol surge and the and the trigger itself so that you can keep your prefrontal cortex online so that you can meet the moment awake instead of, you know, with the red glasses on. <laughs> I love that. Uh, I love that. Uh, meet the moment awake. Because, yeah. as, you know, as you said from the outset, unfortunately, I mean, I think so many people are walking around in a kind of almost a you know a zombie like state you just get yeah. and and here and here's the thing is when you start to when you start to uncover things about yourself oftentimes you know they're not as they're not as big an issue as you actually originally thought they were or as you were giving power to and you're like why was i doing that unfortunately I mean, that's the unfortunate thing about maturing too isn't it that you know yeah. we gain wisdom with age you know and youth is wasted on the young <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly right oh my gosh you know that reminds me of i've uh, the analogy that or i guess the metaphor that pops up in my head as you say that it's like you know with a child you know, the fear of, oh my gosh, there's a monster in my closet. There's a monster in my closet. I, uh -huh. And it's the anxiety and the, and the overwhelm that a child will feel just with that uncertainty and the unknowing until you actually open the closet and you're like, oh, wait, well, there's nothing there. And, mm -hmm. and it's, you know, for most of us, we so fear opening that closet because we're so afraid of what we're going to find. But, you know, when we go through the motions of opening the closet, we realize, oh, 
this is a heck of a lot more manageable than all that anxiety I was feeling worrying about opening the closet. And so, yeah, I think <laughs> you're exactly right. Yeah. And you mentioned something earlier about uh, grace and I think kindness and I think uh, forgiveness to yourself, because I, I do feel and I've had this conversation with some other people and they sometimes focus so much on things in the past and regrets and and, oh, mm. you know, I wish I hadn't done that and all of that. And I always say, you know, you need to forgive yourself and just move on. There's nothing you can do to impact that now, um, you know, unless it's something majorly egregious but most of the time it isn't and most of the time whatever you did and even the people you did it to probably don't even remember anyway but um but being kind to forgiving yourself i think that's something that people struggle with oh i you know that's probably one of the biggest topics in, all, in the work that i do as well it's that feeling of embarrassment disappointment shame for the events of the past the decisions we've made in the past and you know the regret that a lot of folks feel about things that have that they were either a part of or did in the past and it's you know it's it's so pervasive it's so pervasive and i i definitely cover this in the book because you know in order to feel free to have inner peace to live a life of joy and freedom and fulfillment you know we really have to take a look at all of that that you've just said and i'm talking about here with this whole thing around shame about our past you know, well, what if, what if you were doing the darn best you could with all that you had because you chose yeah. it, you did it and it happened. And if you had the reserves to choose something otherwise you would have. So let's just imagine that, you know what, let's imagine that that was meant to be, it was on purpose because it got you to this moment. And so part of one of the, one of the perceptual shifts or deliberate choices that I offer in the book is a way of being able to look at our past and find meaning in it and be like, oh, mm -hmm. you know, even though that was really painful, it actually gave me this and it taught me that and it led me to this person to do, and it got me here. And so by ha having a different relationship with what has happened, we can change resistance to appreciation and then thrive in our now moments for our future state as well. And so that, the gosh, and that, I mean, this is such a lovely big conversation but what this requires is a deep understanding that we grow as humans, both in the light and in the dark. Mm. There's no getting around that. You know, we only want to focus on the ways that we grow in the light. Like, oh, because I chose it and it was, and I won and I succeeded and I was wanted. But the truth is we equally grow in the dark, the unwanted, mm -hmm. the pain, the tragedies, and that's life, that's duality. And so part of freeing ourselves to live a life of joy and meaning is to say, you know what? Yeah, I grow equally in the in the light and the dark. So how can I embrace both fully awake? <laughs> you yeah. know, on purpose. Yeah. No, no, I, I love that. That's that's fantastic because uh, the duality. Because you're right. I think we we try to ignore the dark. And yes, yin and yang. Everything is there. Everything is everything is bal. And at the end of the day, balance is what brings. Um, you know what brings satisfaction into your life and and everything is if and balance and you're right you got to embrace embrace both of them yeah um, so listen this has been this has been fantastic and you're correct we could probably go on for about four or five hours now. i mean do a <laughs> yes, long form <laughs> long form podcast um, one day so i hope you'll i am um, all of amy's information is going to be below this video and i would hope you come back someday and we'll continue this conversation but before we go please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do yeah absolutely so as a leadership coach, I, I partner with leaders and teams on all things growth, transformation, and flow. And one of my areas of expertise is communication because this is where everything's happening and this is really interesting to people. So whether it's from public speaking to pitching all the way to creating trust in our interaction dynamics to, you know, all things conversation, like that is my area of expertise. And that to me really is the entry point because this is symptomatic. Communication is a symptom of, here we go, I'm going to say it again, the relationship we have with ourselves. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's all it's all one big system. And so that's that's what I do with uh, with leaders and teams. And, and I'll tell you, I feel like I, I get to live a miracle every day doing this work. Yeah, absolutely. So it's always on purpose.com. As I said, it'll be below the video. And the book, Living on Purpose, 
Yes. Can you show your book again there? For oh, everybody? yeah, absolutely. Living on Purpose. <laughs> Five yeah. Would, yeah. Yeah. And I would I would highly recommend people check it out. I think, you know, if there's one thing that we've learned over the last few years is that we we deserve to be more conscious about the world we're living in. And we deserve to be more conscious about ourselves and we deserve to live a better life. I mean, really, there's you, you, everybody deserves it. So anyway, I would recommend go check out the book and check out Amy's work. Listen, thanks again, Amy. This is a fascinating subject. And thank you all for watching and listening. And I'll see you all again soon. Thank you. Thank you.